This week's episode of the Salt and Sauce Chat Show is sponsored by North Broad Street Records, bringing you the very best in unissued music. North Broad Street Records discovers and brings to vinyl cool, unfinished gems. For more information, please visit www.northbroadst.co.uk. Coming up on this week's Salt and Sauce Chat Show. People think that when you do a blindfold effect, you can see. I genuinely couldn't see, and the reason why you can even see in the video is he was doing that to my face. And I'm one of these people, if someone does that, I react. Yep. And he was sitting, swinging at me, waving his hands at me. I'm going 70 mile an hour and he's sitting doing all this to me. I didn't have a clue. For things like swallowing needles or the, the fishing hook, these can go wrong. Like if you do one thing wrong or they're one centimetre out or something happens, you, they can 100% go wrong. It's just I'm one of the idiots that takes a risk. <laughs> so when COVID hit, within about a week, I lost every single gig for 2020. Every single one. Some got rescheduled, but I lost everything. And you're into six figures at that point, seven figures nearly. Like you're in big, big money at that point. All gone. Welcome along to another episode of the Salt and Sauce Chat Show. I'm David Simmons, and I'm delighted to be joined on this week's show by Fife Bass magician Cameron Young. Cammy, how are you doing? Good, mate. Thanks for coming on the show. No, it's good. Thanks for having me. Now you're welcome. So you're a magician. Yep. Where did this journey begin? How did you get involved in magic? Um, well, it probably started a long time ago. Um, I was about eight years old when I first probably took interest in it. Um, I asked my grandparents to buy me this magic set from America and you couldn't get it in the UK. It was a guy, a guy called Chris Angel, magician. I'd seen it online, it was like QVC style, seen them all doing all these really cool tricks and eventually managed to persuade my grand to get it for my Christmas. Arrived in um, the entire magic box, the only thing I ended up using was a deck of cards. And then I done what, it must have been four or five years of, well, maybe that wouldn't have been as long as that, a couple of years of practicing and kind of just started to lose interest in it thinking it wasn't the coolest thing and then eventually watched Penn and Teller fool us. I must be about 14 year old and since then it's just been a non-stop. Been hooked on it. Yeah. So you you mentioned the, the magic set that your grandparents got you. Were you kind of doing tricks on them and the family members and stuff? Yeah, or? like I, I know I wasn't the greatest. I even I even got two gigs. Um, so I'd done a couple of children's parties, which was really weird because I was actually a kid at the time as well. So I was out performing, um, doing like £50 a show. And yeah, I got a good reception for it, but then obviously over the years you realise that they're obviously reacting for the sake of reacting until you actually get proper reactions when you when you become better at it. Then Is that different. part of the buzz, the reaction you get when you... I would say so. See when you learn a new trick and then you get the buzz. It's so much better. But see when you're, like, you're looking at a, a, maybe a trick that you performed over and over again at a wedding 24-7, like there's ones that I know I can do really, really well. I'm not trying to boast or anything, but I know I can. <laughs> yep. You don't. You know what's going to happen. You know when they're going to. You could even tell them when they're going to react because you just know it's going to happen. But when you learn a new trick and you're nervous to perform it, or you're worried in case it goes wrong and it does go really well, or you've done a stage show that you put so much effort into and you maybe get like a stand innovation, that's like you never get better moments than that. Brilliant. So who did you kind of aspire to be when you were younger? Who did you look up to? You've obviously got like your Darren Browns, David Blaine's, even. Uh, Paul Daniels for example who is oh. it you kind of aspire to be I was lucky enough to go to a Paul Daniels show with my dad right. um, it was the first ever magic show my dad actually used to be a magician he well, doesn't, he doesn't yeah. tell many people this but he did um, and I inspired to be him but then as soon as I watched David Blaine it all changed so every single bit of magic I do I try and put a David Blaine a style onto it or a David Blaine twist onto it because in my mind he's the guy that made the type of magic that I do um, popular Right. So, I mean, as you got older, you were starting to get recognised for your magic. In 2018 and 19, you are awarded the Edinburgh Close-Up Magician of the Year. Yeah. That which, must have been quite nice to get recognised for your work. It actually was, because I entered it in 2017, not knowing what I was going into. And I think it was a very good learning curve. I don't know where I ranked, but I don't, I don't think I really want to know where I ranked. <laughs> but it was just, I kind of got the vibe for it. And then in 2018, I went back with the act that I was hoping going to win it. And to be honest, halfway through that year... I, or halfway through that the competition I genuinely thought I had a chance in that and then ended up winning it and then when I went back in 2019 I didn't even go into win I didn't to be honest I didn't even prepare for it I just done what I usually do I went and done the exact act that I usually do and to be fair I ended up winning it again and I don't know if I get 2020 as well because it's not going ahead in 2020 due to COVID so I don't know if I'm three years running right. or if I just get to see the longest because no one's ever won it more than two years Wow. So my name will be on the trophy for the longest, hopefully. So you'll still defend your title in 2021 then? Of course. Perfect. Of course. So that opened some doors for you, didn't it? Because after that, you, you went over to America and did some 
work over there with a sort of Camp America style thing, wasn't it? Yeah, it was kind of lucky because I ended up having a meeting. I don't even know where it came about. My friend introduced me to this girl that worked um, or played with um, the uh, the hockey ice hockey team in Kirkcaldy. So I went and met her there and she basically explained this entire camp, how amazing it was. She'd been before and they really were looking for a magician. But because they found out I was from Fife, they basically had someone that was from Fife years before that was teaching sports. So I went along, met her, um, didn't tell anybody about this. I literally just went off the, I just went by myself and basically there and then got offered a spot at a place called Long Lake Camp of the Arts, which is in America. So it's in New York, but closer to Canada. Mm. Um, so you're not in the centre, you're about a four or five hour drive up north. And it was insane. Um, it was nerve wracking because I was working for my, my parents full time. I had been for about five, six years at that point. And I decided to take the leap. I went and met my mum and dad. I said to them, what would you think if I went off to America? And then at the end of that conversation, I had to admit to them that I'd already booked the plane tickets and I was going anyway. So I just kind of had to try and sweet talk them into it. But I did go and it was fantastic. I ended up teaching magic um, to some... The, the difference with this, it wasn't really a Camp America style one. It was you had to be known in your art or you had to be well known because to, for a kid to go there, you were thousands. It wasn't just you turned through them... You, you, take them to camp on the summer, this one you had to either be a very high-end, rich person, a celebrity, someone like that. Like a Catherine zeta Jones's daughter was there. Oh, wow. And Penn from Penn and Teller's daughter was there, which worked out really, really well. Yeah. Um, but I was um, the magician for the day, or for the, the whole summer. I'd done the magic. Um, and then, to be fair, someone pulled out that was a joiner, and I ended up doing a lot of the set building at night. So it was a long shift, 16 hours a day. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, so, I mean, you've, you've taken magic right over the world, like we said. Um, yeah. You've been to America, you've been to Italy, you've obviously travelled quite far and wide. Vegas we'll touch on as well later in the interview. But you're part of the Magic Circle. Yeah. What What is that? I've heard it like thrown about in terminology to do with magicians. What What is the Magic Circle? So to most people it seems to be like a rumour because they don't know if it's actually true or if it's not. Um, but there's many small versions of it and then there's the real one in London. Yeah. Um, to be, get into the real one in London, the big Magic Circle, you have to be 18. So I found out um, that Perth Magic Circle was available and you were supposed to be it was either 16 or 18 to join, but at 13 I managed to get in. Um, so I went in, was there. Then I was actually working for my dad. And at this point I was working in an engraving and trophy shop. And when this customer came in and he said he was looking for a new trophy. And it was for Edinburgh Magic Circle. And at this point I was 17 going into 18. And I decided, you know what, I will ask him the question. And within three weeks I was then a member. I passed my audition first time. And then... About when I was 21, 22, I decided to fly down to London and give the London Magic Circle a go. But the really cool thing was, one of the box sets I got when I was a kid, and when I was about 9, 10 year old, there was a Marvin's Magic box set. Now, the person that was actually interviewing me, and the person that was actually watching my audition to make sure I'd done it right, was Marvin's Magic. Right. And he came up afterwards, shook my hand, he went, don't worry, you're in. And then just went, shh, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Superb. No, that's brilliant. So, um, like I say, you've taken your magic all over the world. You went down to the auditions at Britain's Got Talent yeah. recently, didn't you? Um, obviously, I've seen you on the telly. How was that experience being part of a big production like Britain's Got Talent? It was different. Um, it's something I've been trying to, it's not like I've been trying to get into it for like the last year. It's been something I've been trying to get in for a long time. Um, to, speaking to... Um, reps but then to be fair I kind of snuck in in a way so I'd actually asked the head of magic if I could get in and he basically said no like the act I didn't have an act it wasn't right so then I found out who else was ahead in the departments and a lot of online searches and I eventually found this lady that was going to help me out and she basically says no I can't meet you and so I said when are you going to be in she went well I'm in Edinburgh on this date but there's no way I'm going to have time for you so I kind of snuck into that meeting room <laughs> So I actually turned up in Edinburgh on that day, snuck into that meeting room and said, give me five minutes. And 45 minutes later, I left there with a Britain's Got Talent edition. That's amazing. So that was pretty cool. So um, my family drove down. Um, I'd, I'd just finished two shows. I got three days warning to when I was on the stage. Um, I'd just finished two shows, 11 o'clock at night on a Saturday night. The family drove down to London, um, got there at 6 a.m. Had to be there for 10 a.m., I was on stage, um, looking at the stage, seeing what I was actually going to be up against. You actually, you don't just go out on stage, you actually get a wee look just to see what it's going to be like, just because it's for TV, they want to make sure you know what you're doing. Yeah. And then I didn't actually get on stage till quarter to 11 at night. 
Oh wow! So I hadn't slept in two days. It was a long thing. So it's a bit, a bit of a blur. I got, I got through, which is the main thing. They don't actually show that I got through, but I did get through, and um, because I got put on the unseen version, uh, just unlucky on my part. And yeah, it was a really good success, and I got to meet Ant and Dec. That's and what I was going to say. So you've obviously brushed shoulders with likes of them. Was Steve Mulhern there as well? And he wasn't. He right. wasn't there. It was um, Ant Deck, uh, David Williams, Amanda Holdham, Alicia Dixon, and Simon Cowell. So um, how were, how were they like working so close with them? How was it? I'll tell you who I really liked. I liked I liked Deck and David Williams. Right. <laughs> um, no comment on the rest. Nah, to be fair, they were all okay. Um, I don't think Simon. I got really unlucky. To be fair, um, the person right before me got the golden buzzer. Oh right, okay. So you, I, it's hard to follow uh, that. Yeah. Sure. So he got the golden buzzer, and I don't know. It was just like. I actually took a weight off my shoulders because I was so nervous going on and that's everybody was talking about golden buzzers all day. So the fact that it was a person in front of me, it was kind of like gutting, but I was like, well, I've got nothing to lose now. Yeah. It's not like I'm going out there trying to fight for one. I'm just going to go out because the chances of getting two in a row is just not going to happen in my opinion. I, don't, I could be wrong, but I was like, you know what? I'll just go out, try my best. I think I did an okay. Presentation was good. I think it went really well, but considering um, the trick actually went wrong the week before, Oh, really? um, so it's quite a dangerous act to do so, so for anybody that never actually seen that um, you put a, a fishing hook like a three barred fishing hook in your mouth mm -hmm. that which has got four ropes on it and you gave one each of the judges and you told them to pull on it one at a time obviously one of them was attached to the hook yeah and it was Ant and Deck that made the decisions yep because you couldn't actually speak you had it up on the, the VT behind you didn't you yeah now you said it went wrong the week before <laughs> so what you don't realise is if with these fishing hooks if it goes in it's not designed to come back out. Yeah, because it's got a barb on it, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. Yeah. So getting out, I had to get pliers into my mouth, and it was okay. I think I could have gotten a lot worse area, basically. I got underneath my tongue, so it was okay. I think I just caught the end of the skin, which was good. I know it sounds good, but it was. It could have went a lot worse, basically. Um, but, yeah, it was really weird. But the thing was, when we got down there, the quality of the video was recording on 4K camera, but they said it's not good enough for the screen. So there was me and my dad. We were out in the middle of London trying to find any bit of grassy area with a nice sunset. So luckily it was a sunny day, it was cold but sunny, we could actually record me. So an, about an hour before I was going on stage for the first time, I was outside recording again what will be up on the screen. So they don't give you much notice and genuinely I had like two to three days notice maximum to when I was on stage. Yep. And then you get told um, 11 o'clock in the morning or 12 o'clock in the morning or lunchtime you that when you're going to be on stage and I was like last. So it was right at the very end of the day. Well, that's it. I mean, the way they portray the show is that you rock up, you sign in, you get given a sticker, and then you go and meet the judges. But it's it's far from that, is it? Miles from that, but I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna <laughs> put not them gonna in there too the much. Magic. Not gonna put in too much. No. So I mean, like you say, um, the whole COVID thing happened this year, which obviously prevented them like getting you back down for like a further yes you're through to the next round no you're not it was all kind of done through like a zoom sort of thing wasn't it it was i didn't so basically they were unsure to the last minute i had friends that made the final and they were told they weren't even getting through so everything was changing on a day-to-day -day basis so that you just didn't believe anything they were hearing i think to be fair the people that just didn't get through just got unlucky if i'm being yeah. totally honest um i think my act was good. It maybe just wasn't good enough for what they were after. Um, I have I've got really good friends that were in the final. Two really good friends that were in the final, and one of them, not saying who, genuinely didn't think he was through. And then he got to semi finals, won the semi final, was straight in the edition, and then got to the final, and I think he came third or fourth. I'm not sure exactly where. So, um, the guys have done amazing, but right. nobody knew. You just you're so you're left in the dark. Nobody knows what they're doing, where they have to be, what they're doing. It's just. It's quite a difficult situation knowing that your fate's left in someone else's hands, but you don't know where you're going to get to go, to be honest. Yeah. Now, like I said earlier, you've done quite a bit of travelling. You took yeah, yeah. the same trick over to Italy, didn't you? Yeah, well, I was hoping to do something different, to be honest. Um, I got the same night it went live, or the same day, I got a phone call. Um, and it was a guy called Enrico from Italy, and he says there's a show called Two... Two CQ vowels. So I don't even know what it means. Um, I even flew there and I still didn't know what it meant. I was like <laughs> flying there. Um, but he talked about it. And then I never heard anything for a good two, three months. And then I got a phone call saying, do you want to come? And it was right during the middle of COVID and everything, the lockdown, we were, we were completely shut down. I wasn't even supposed to be flying properly. But because it was for business purposes, I was allowed to. And they flew me out to Italy. It, to be honest, the recording I got was fantastic. They edited it really well. I didn't want to be doing that trick, but they kind of insisted on that trick. I wore a kilt to make it more appeal for their TV. Got really good TV coverage in Italy. Brilliant for my um, my showreel. The only thing was, 
it was probably one of the worst trips of my life. Oh, really? In what way, sorry? Um, on the way there, from Edinburgh, I had to fly via France. So uh, Edinburgh to Paris was good. Paris was mobbed in the middle of lockdown. And it was, I mean, mobbed. And then you flew from there to Italy. And where we were staying, there was nothing around. You had a hotel where you could go and get your, your breakfast, lunch and dinner. You had the place you'd go and record. I got three hours notice that I wasn't on the first day. So I had to sit in my hotel room for 24 hours. And then I got told on the second day. And then I basically asked them to rearrange my flight and get me home earlier. Because I was done. They would have wanted me to wait another two days just in the hotel room. I was like, no, get me home. I just found out my fiancé was pregnant. I'm like, no, I'm getting out of here. Oh, well, I mean, Italy was one of the, the kind of hot spots as well. They kind of just shut up shop for everything, didn't they? Yeah, and this exactly. was, was this right in the middle of all that? Yeah. Wow. Um, how was the experience, obviously, with the, the language barrier? How did you cope? Because the judges didn't speak English, did they? You had a translator, is that right? It was very difficult. Now, bearing in mind, if you are a magician, you are thinking about lots of things going on. So you need to remember your moves, you need to remember the handling, the music. There's so much. And not only that, with my act, it was even harder because I had to listen to what was on the screen. But they actually put an earpiece in my ear, and every time I said something... Um, there would be speakers outside that would translate it into Italian. But every time the judges say something, there'd be a delay, and I would get it in English in my ear. So I was listening for the delay, listening for the screen, trying to work out what the translation was saying. It, was, it wasn't easy. And I've got friends that were across there, for example. I'll give them a shout-out. Kevin Quantum, another fantastic magician. Um, he was on Britain's Got Talent. He made the semi-finals this year, which was good. Name, yeah, yeah. Um, he was the one that was doing the fireballs. He even admitted the same. Um, it's not an easy thing to have with the translation but again he he nailed it as well which was good so brilliant have you got any aspirations to maybe do any more of these kind of shows i mean i've been in talks with them um i always wanted to do america's got talent and to be honest i was right there i was so close and then covid literally that's what happened i performed the show back in december um so let me take you back a little bit um back to when 2018 it was the, no sorry, 2019, it was 8th of March and I had sold out the Rothes Halls in Glen Rothes. It was, a, it was at exact stage I seen Paul Daniels. It was the first ever magic show I went to with my dad and I thought, you know what, I'd love to sell that out. So my parents were like, oh yeah, you're going to do um, March 2020. I was like, no, in 2019, this is like two months before it was supposed to actually happen and I managed to sell it out, which was good. So oh, yeah. we'd done that show and I thought, you know what, I'll do it again at Christmas. So last Christmas I'd done two shows in one day. And I decided to record a new a new effect that I'd been working on for ages. Got it recorded, and sent it off to America, and it was looking like a go. And then COVID hit, and we couldn't go. So, and at the moment, I don't know if how safe it would be to go across to do that at the moment. So, I think it might be a few years time. I might be getting to go back to America and hopefully, fingers crossed, me America's got talent. Fingers crossed, me. Hope that works for you. So, I mean, you've been to America before. You've done Camp America. Um, you actually travelled to Vegas and you spent some time with uh, Penn Gillette from Penn and Teller, didn't you? Yeah, well, it was quite a coincidence. Uh, when I was working in America, in New York, at that, that camp, I was supposed to do sign-ups. So how it worked is every act would go up on stage and you'd explain what you do. So circus, they'd do a couple of trapezes, they'd do a few things, and then they'd say, if you want to sign up, come and see me at the end. And it would go through everything, theatre, and then it came to magic. So I'd go up to a couple of really cool tricks. And then you get a list of a line of people at the very end. Now, on average, there's 300 kids per session times three. So it'd be two-week blocks times three. And the kids decided that the circus, there's 10 members of the circus, there's one magician. And they, there was an average about 70 people went to circus. On an average, 104 kids wanted magic lessons. So it was like, oh, it was... It was hard. Like, even the owners had never seen anything like that. They just didn't know how to make it possible. I was actually trying to teach other camp members how to do tricks so they could actually help me teach the children, basically. And you couldn't let them down because their parents are paying so much. And yeah. if, if they go back saying, oh, but I never got to do magic, they'll be phoning up saying, why did the kid not get to do magic? But then there was a lineup, and I just, next person, what's your name? Moxie. And straight away it just clicked because Moxie Gillette is Penn's daughter. And I just knew straight away, and I went, I know you, who you are, and she went, I knew you would, and just walked away. So every single person had to get like a group lesson, maybe like 10, I had to work out to 10 kids, but Moxie always got a lesson to herself, <laughs> <laughs> because I wanted to, sh sh to show her a cool trick. And then the day that her mum came to watch the show, she was running late. Both her kids were at two different camps, so I think it was gaming camp, and there was one that was at the, the magic camp. 
And so that she missed the show for Moxie. Moxie was quite upset. So I decided to open up the theatre for her. And Moxie could go up on stage. She could record it. So Emily's sitting there, which is her mum, was sitting recording Moxie. But I didn't realise she was on FaceTime to Penn. Wow. So they handed me the phone and I was like, oh, hello. And it was me chatting to Penn, which was Because he's a big deal in magic, isn't he? Huge. Well, if it wasn't for him, I don't think I would be doing magic today. There you go. So it was amazing. And then we kept in touch over Facebook. We had a lot of similar interests, me and Emily. We love going to shows, playing poker. There were loads of different things we like to do. And then she just said, do you want to come for, over for Thanksgiving? Well, like so to the family house? Yeah. Oh, wow. So in 2018, I flew over to Vegas. Um, longest trip ever. Here to London, London to New York, wait in New York and then New York to Vegas. Um, but it was amazing. I spent 10 days in um, 2018 and 20, uh, sorry, I, 2018, 2019, and it was phenomenal. Yeah. Absolutely phenomenal. I had the best time ever um, playing poker, watching shows. I was front row seats for David Copperfield, getting to hang out with David Copperfield after the show. Matt Franco, who won America's Got Talent, getting to meet him after the show. Every show you went to, you got to go meet them afterwards. Piff the Magic Dragon, a guy called Matt King, who's one of my heroes. So many people I got to go meet. Um, and if it wasn't for Emily, to be fair, it would never happen. And then on Thanksgiving, I got, well, Penn and Teller, obviously. I went to Penn and Teller live and twice now, and I got to hang out backstage with Penn and Teller. All their magician friends that were always there, the people that were writing for the show, which are famous to me. Um, meeting them the guy that works for David Copperfield that's even famous in the magic world and they basically said do you want to come for Thanksgiving dinner both years and yeah I did with all the friends and family just Thanksgiving which I'd never had before but well that's amazing because they say you should never meet your hero but obviously this one's obviously paid off wasn't it yeah it's been absolutely amazing absolutely amazing um, we didn't spend that much time chatting me and Penn if I'm being totally honest I spent more time like Moxie teaching her tricks yep. chatting to Emily who I became really good pals with um, but it was just amazing just to see I've done that and then I got the inspiration of Taylor as well when he's giving you some advice I got to show them one of the tricks that I first went viral when I was back when I was like 16 year old I, I'd done a magic trick and I went on the lad bible um, a lab Bible Australia hit like 5 million views overnight wow. and I got to perform that for them and they said it was really good and gave me some wee tips oh, which cool. because I, I remember they, they had that show on the TV where it was you, you had to do a trick and try and fool them fool us as yeah. to how, how, how you done it that still goes on you ever thought about going on that or I have you got a, a sort of cross connection now it's, ki it's kind of difficult I always wanted to do it always wanted to do it it was in the UK for series 1 and I think it's now on like series 8 or 9 and um, I think it's going to be the last series coming up um, I could be wrong but this is what I've heard over YouTube and videos I don't actually know the truth um, but it is performing in America just now but if you know them pretty well it's kind of difficult to get on they don't like if they know you they want to know nothing about you so you've got a really good chance of fooling them they think they've seen my magic but to be fair they've seen one trick of mine I've never really performed magic for any of them so yeah. Maybe just get the skies and go and then disguise. Yeah, it's just difficult to know with America. You have to quarantine when you oh, get there, quarantine yeah. when you get back. It's just... Yeah, I mean, that's 2020, which we'll touch on in just a second. But we're, we're going to name drop even further. We've chucked in uh, Penn and Teller, etc. Because you've done magic for quite a few people, like heavyweight boxer Tony Bellew. Yeah. George Groves. All these kind of guys. How, how was it doing magic in front of them? So... There's uh, an event called An Evening With, I'll give him a shout out, Craig does an amazing job, he doesn't make anything from it but he gets some of the best boxers in the world to come to Dunfermline usually and we do, like it's called An Evening With for the reason it's An Evening With the person and it starts off with like a drinks reception, I go around entertaining people and it was fantastic, Tony Bellew was the first one I went to, I got to get there about half an hour, 45 minutes before and spend a good half hour with Tony showing him tricks, having a laugh with him. Um, he was freaking out. I got videos of me recording with him. Not only that, there was Al Faran, the impressionist that year, who's been pretty famous in the Lad Bible, getting his name out there. And it was just phenomenal. And I got to stay and watch the whole show. And some of the stories Tony t tells, just unbelievable. He's a big guy, isn't oh, he? None, nobody was going to mess with him there, so there was no getting any booze. Cause <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was good. I got to spend the, practically the night with him, having a good laugh with him. And then the next year was George Groves, which was a bit more of a different experience. Um, got, George was a lovely guy, I had to chat with him, but they asked me to be the stage magician. But it was weird because nobody was interested that year. Right. And it was probably one of the hardest, toughest shows I've ever had to do. It was amazing for the close-up. I think everyone had had a few too many by the time I got up on stage. It was like being in a Glasgow comedy club. Oh, right. um, but it went really a good reception for George Groves. But um, I think for an event like that, I'll be sticking to the close-up magic for that. And the stage shows for the Edinburgh Fringe like I did last year. Brilliant. So I've, I've been looking at a few of your tricks online. Um, the one that really stood out for me was Knock Hill Race Circuit. You'd done it blindfolded at 60 miles an hour. Yeah, so How did that come about, mate? 
I was actually the resident magician at Not Kill for, right. a, for a fair few time for a fair while. All the events that have me up there walking around. Um, I know you're probably thinking it's a bit of a weird place to have it, but we thought we'd do an advertising thing, but also something quite dangerous. So first of all, we looked at like vanishing a Ferrari, and we looked at like loads of different things which I I could do. But the one thing that I decided to do was like, you know what, I'd like to take one of the pro racers. Now, unfortunately, the guy I wanted to take out is either going to be Gordon Shedden, who is the touring car champion several times over, or Rory Butcher, who's a current touring car driver and was in, he's been in the top 10 for near all the races recently, um, a wee hero of mine. I was hoping to get one of them and go out and make them a bit nervous, but I, well, I still got someone amazing, one of the uh, one of the best commentators I've I've ever met, and um, I took him out, and it was just, it was good fun. It was it was actually scary because I'd never performed it before. So the first time of me ever driving blindfolded was a time of not kill. Wow! So it was it was very scary. Thing is, what I obviously didn't know because people think that when you do a blindfold effect, you can see. I genuinely couldn't see, and the reason why you can even see in the video is he was doing that to my face, and I'm one of these people. If someone does that, I react. Yeah. And he was sitting swinging at me, waving his hands at me. I'm going 70 mile an hour, and he's sitting doing all this to me. I didn't have a clue. Do, do you have a preference? Do you prefer the the big sort of like you say David Blaine dramatic ones or the the slight hand card tricks? Do you have a preference as to what ones? I like a mixture of both. I like doing an act that people can react to. So especially if it's getting recorded, because some things it's difficult. Like the the driving blindfolded was great because people know it's real because the man, he, he's freaking out. He's petrified. He's in a car with someone seventy mile an hour. I'm blindfolded and he's holding on to his seatbelt the whole time. So you get people get the emotion of like what's going on. But for example, if I was to do that just by myself, people would go, "All right, there's yeah. obviously some sort of trick to that." Yep. When there's someone there that's not in on it, freaking out. So I think I like the bigger things, but I like it when it can be done with somebody else there. Um, I'm not the biggest fan of... Yeah, I'm not the biggest fan of doing like maybe like a big, massive stage piece that you don't get a reaction to, but I'd done a, a show last last year when I'd done The Fringe. I was performing three shows a day, and then I decided to do a show in Bowness. Right. And I didn't even... I didn't charge for it. I didn't charge at all for it, and I just invited everybody along, and I think we ended up getting... 100, 150 people, something like that, turned up. And to be honest, it was the best show I've ever performed. And it's one of the feelings when you came off, you just knew you'd done really well, and it got really, it got recorded. And I ended up performing a piece where I swallow 20 needles. And then I swallow a bit of Fred. Someone's upstairs checking my mouth, making sure it's okay, and then I pull them all out. And it's actually on my YouTube channel. And I, I, it's pieces like that that even when I'm watching, I'm going, I couldn't have performed that any better. So the fact that you got that recorded... I could do that another hundred times over, but you would never get it that perfect. Yeah, that's the ones you want. Wow! So I'm, I, you've just kind of took me back a wee bit with the twenty. Needles. How do you prepare for something like that, mate? How swallowing twenty needles? Well, do you I, genuinely swallow them? I'm, yeah. I'm not asking to like. Yeah, well, reveal your there secrets. Are, obviously, <laughs> being a magician, there is obviously tricks to some things, but there's some things that genuinely don't have a trick to it. You have to, for example, if you spout water, you have to be able to swallow water and spout it back up. You've yep. got no other option. It's just a skill that you find that you can have. Um, so it's just a lot. There is obviously, everybody knows, there is some secrets into magic and you never want to know. The people that try and work them out, they probably deserve to know how it's done because they're putting that much effort into trying to work out how it's done. It's just entertainment at the end of the day. But for things like swallowing needles or the, the fishing hook, these can go wrong. Like if you do one thing wrong or they're one centimeter out or something happens, you, they can 100% go wrong. It's just I'm one of the idiots that takes a risk. <laughs> Um, we, we talked off air about this um, So it's something I want to talk about just now um, The Covid effect yeah. you, you obviously, like you mentioned before It's 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 uh, it stopped your plans of going to America's Got Talent um, You obviously do a lot of uh, corporate functions Like you mentioned with Tony Bellew, etc yeah. um, You do weddings and corporate events How's it affected your year? Um, well, I've never really talked about this to anybody To be honest, like apart from family and friends Um I'm one of these people that if someone says you can't do something, I like proving them wrong. Only if I want to. For example, last year when I lost a lot of weight, someone said to me, I bet you can't run 5K in under 20 minutes. So I've done it in 19 minutes. Wow. So, But I trained for that and trained for that. Well, somebody actually came up to me and said, you can't... A teacher actually said to me when I was at school, magician is not a career. So I was like, well, it is. And then at that moment, I just went, you know what? I'm going to leave school because it is a career. And then from there onward, someone else says, well... 
it's not going to be a million pound company. It's impossible to be a magician and make a million pound company unless you're Dynamo. And I was like, well, I don't believe that to be true. So I worked out all the, the, the stats with that and I decided, you know what, I'm going to try this. I realised if I invested and done at least a minimum of one wedding fair a week for the entire 2019 and I managed to get something like, I had a target of gigs at every single wedding fair, I would be able to have that for the next five, six years. It would be a million pound company, basically. So I spent all my 2019, every penny I earned went into wedding fairs. I was doing the highest end ones, the most expensive ones, making my name everywhere, and it was a massive success. I was coming into January 2020 with over 100 weddings, plus stage shows, plus fringe shows, plus everything else that was going on. It was going to be a massively good year. Obviously not showing any profits the year before because I was spending it all on wedding fairs and all these things. So when COVID hit, within about a week, I lost every single gig for 2020. Every single one. Some got rescheduled, but I lost everything. And you're into six figures at that point, seven figures nearly. Like <sighs> you're in big, big money at that point, all gone. But there's nothing I can do about it. And the government was refusing to help because you go to the government and they go, well, last year you didn't show a massive profit. We can't help you. Mm. So the people that are actually working their backside off to make their years, and I know a few other people, I know a guy that plays music. Mm. Um, he was playing music professionally, brilliant he spent all last year kind of doing what i was doing he was fully booked for weddings all the time every single he was an acoustic guitarist out there singing he is a phenomenal i was recommending him for so many things and he lost everyone as well and we're both in the same boat because we spent doing we were doing the work that people don't want to do yeah. basically we were doing the work that nobody would do they wouldn't if they're like well if i'm earning 700 pound this weekend oh guess what i can go on holiday next week we were going no we could buy that wedding fair or we can do this because we're investing in the future. We were doing the work that many people don't do. And because we've done that, we got kind of shot in the foot a little. That's oh, absolutely tragic, mate. I'm, I mean, you don't seem the kind of guy that's going to sit about and just feel sorry for yourself. What, what did you do um, all this year to basically make well, a living? <laughs> for the first four weeks, I kind of cried in my pillow. Um, to be fair, I... I don't blame you, mate. I was... I actually hit, I think... I don't know if it was mental health or something, but I did hit a, a, an all-time low, like... At the start of lockdown, I was the lowest I think I'd ever been, not like in any other way, just for business-wise, because the amount of work I'd put in, I'd put everything in for at least two years to get to the way I was, and just getting kind of trying to chat to weddings who are making out as if it's the biggest deal. Yeah, I, I would hate to have lost my wedding, or yeah, they're having a bad time, but I'm losing everybody's wedding. Mm -hmm. um, so it was kind of hard trying to chat to clients, moaning clients, people even asking for deposits back, people asking when you can't even do things like that it's just it was it was a really not a very good time and I'd lost six and a half stone the year before and I'd stopped training gyms were closing so I had no motivation so I ended up putting a bit of weight on two three stone back on just hit an all-time low and then there was just one day um I don't know what triggered it but I just sat and I was watching YouTube videos and I started watching a motivational video and it just triggered something. I was like, you know what? I'm just being an idiot. Like, I need to get back out there. I tried to do some Zoom shows, but I just, I didn't get the same buzz. So I thought, right, I need to try something different. So I came up with an idea. I got some logos together of having my own clothing brand. Um, and I had two ideas. So one was um, like a startup company, like a little practice clothing brand. And I'd always, I'd always wanted my clothing brand, to be fair. It's something I had thought about years before, but I just never even thought about it at the start of lockdown. And then I seen a training course online and I thought, you know what, I'm going to try this training course. It was all the money I practically owned. I had no other money. It was like 1,200 quid to do this training course. So I put all my leftover money into this training course and that's where my new company was born. I Basically, you had to list what you were wanting to do in one of the modules. There was many modules and it says, if you can find something that kind of explains the product, but something that you're keen on and something that you love, you'll fight for it. And then I realised that motivational video kind of changed the way I thought. And then that's where motivational clothing And you're arrived. sporting one of the hoodies yes. right now, aren't you, mate? Yeah, motivational it's... clothing things. Yeah. So is it, is it like a sportswear sort of clothing? Yeah. So I was massively fan of fitness. I still am. That's me back training again, back on the weight loss again. And I've always been a massive fan of fitness. Football, shinty. Um, I played a lot of shinty throughout the years. Um, the rugby. I've done, I've done everything. And I love going to the gym. So... There's a lot of going on with mental health nowadays, so motivation, I thought it'd be a good kind of start off, and it's not, it, one of the goals with the motivational clothing um, is to eventually 
maybe we make a mental health charity with it as well because I can see what the the sides of it are, and it's basically it it's gym gear, gym clothing, gym just it's basically a modern version of Gym Shark. Yeah. Um, it's basically a Scottish version of Gym Shark with my own twist on it, and. It took everything. It took eight months to build. I had to learn how to... I'm not a website developer. I do marketing. I do magic tricks, right? That's what, that's what I'm good at. So I built. I learned how to build websites, learned how to edit videos. So I now can do Premiere Pro. I can now build the website. I managed to find out how to products, how to speak to suppliers in China. And it was just something to drive every day. And then eventually, two weeks ago, it launched. So that's it up and live, motivationalclothing.com. It was eight months of blood, sweat, and tears. Many, I think I, I went three days without sleep one time just to get bits done on the website to get it built. But eventually, it's here. And no, I mean, I can see it right in front of me. It's good quality. I mean, like you said, motivationalclothing.com. Can people purchase directly from yeah, the website? Yeah, on there, free shipping. We've got a December sale. We're going to be probably running it into January as well for the the January weight loss. Uh, everything, everyone's a wee bit of that. So, um, not only that, you save ten because I'll give you ten percent off. Save ten. Anyone that watches this show gets a wee 10% oh, off. Perfect. Love that. Um, is this your new baby then? Is this yeah. Or are you still going to balance it with magic as well? I've not made my mind up. Um, I think I'll still do the magic. I think I will. But at the moment, it's just, um, to be honest, crowds. Yeah. Uh, I've got... I don't think, that without being too blunt, I don't think you've got an option really. You can't go back to magic yet. I mean, although people are being told they can book their weddings again next year, but while it's still uncertain, uh, you'd be silly to jump back in with two feet with that right now, wouldn't you? I would obviously honour anybody that's obviously booked me and moved them and then I just have to... I'm playing every day by every day by day because I've got elderly grandparents and I couldn't live with myself if I went to one of these events, came home yep. and then became ill and passed it to one of them. Yep. That's that's the thing that I'm thinking about. So it's not about me, it's not about how much money I earn doing a show or anything like that. To me, it's just about my family and making sure that they're safe, making sure everyone else is safe. So I wouldn't want to go out and risk their health for the sake of me doing a magic show for somebody. So until I know that it's safe to go and do so, because I'll be mixing and mingling with every single group, so even if there's someone over here and someone's got COVID over here, I will literally get to them eventually because I will be entertaining everybody. Yeah. Um, the stage shows is a bit different. I'll be on stage, so I think I might be looking into maybe booking out some theatres um, for 2021, but I just need to wait and see when we get the go-ahead. If we get the go-ahead, it'll be the first thing I do. Yeah, because you've got your own website as well, so if people do want to maybe book you in the future, where yeah, can Yeah, cameronyoung.co.uk. You can watch some of my videos. You've got Britain's Got Talents on... Um, I don't think it's on my website yet, but you can check it out, Cameron Young on... Uh, YouTube, there's also a show reel there for me as well, which you can see the, the performance with the needles. Uh, that's on there, needles and coin trick as well. So I don't post enough. I used to post so much more. When I was like 16, 17, I was posting daily. Mm -hmm. um, and I was getting so many views. I don't know why. It was probably the best time to do it. I was, some, I was like hitting 100,000 views a month. And yeah. somehow I just decided to go away and I became 18, found out what a bar was. Um, so most of my weekends <laughs> were in there rather than practicing and just... So, yeah, it kind of changed. I liked actually being out there. Like when I was in a bar, I'd be showing people effects. I'd be doing things, and but they'd always be asking when's the next video. But I was spending so much time with socialising. Um, I kind of regret not continuing with the magic. So I think it'll be something I'll be doing soon with this TikTok and everything that's going on. Yeah, no, get online, check out Cameron Young, ladies and gentlemen, Cameron Young. Oh, thank you.